for today's podcast, we're going to be looking at the lumbar spine and considering the functional anatomy, kinesiology, and biomechanics from approximately a 30,000 foot view. We're going to give a broad, more generalized overview. There will be a couple areas where we get a little bit more specific. However, this is really meant to provide a refresher on this content rather than dive really, really uh, almost at a granular level into particular topics. Before we get started, quick reminder that this will contain some fair use material that falls under both the Fair Use Act disclaimer as well as copyright disclaimer. Additional references if you're looking for content uh, at, again, that more granular level can be found in Raymond's text. Uh, Newman and Oedas, both kinesiology texts, as well as Dutton and McGee, uh, the more daily anatomy text, and then finally Cleland's uh, text, which is a net or orthopedic clinical examination. Our objectives for today are as followed. We will be identifying the joints of the vertebral column and discussing the function of the lumbar spine as well as some anomalies of the lumbar spine. We'll be looking at the intervertebral disc as well as a general overview of the anatomy of the thoracolumbar spine, some of the muscles that surround that area and fascia, and then really describing some of the general principles of these areas as well. In order to do that, let's start with a general appreciation of the spinal column, the vertebral column. There's 33 total vertebra, and really the function here is to support the trunk for upright posture. That trunk is what we call the hat unit, the head, arms, and trunk. And particularly when we get to the lumbar spine, which is highlighted here for you in red, we see that the primary movements are flexion extension, as well as lateral flexion and rotation. However, these do not occur in the same proportion throughout all the segments. And so you'll notice that the lines as they move on the horizontal here from T12 down, they're not exactly the exact length as the one next to it. The one exception to that is rotation, though as we move into the lower lumbar spine, what we would call the lumbosacral spine, you'll notice there is a loss of rotation. But flexion and extension, each level has a slightly different contribution. The typical spinal vertebra is also different as we move throughout the lumbar spine. Illustrated for you here is a cervical, a thoracic, and a lumbar vertebra. There's a few things that should stick out to you. First, as we look at the body, the size is going to differ as we move from the upper spine cervical to the lower lumbar spine. Additionally, the orientation of the facet joint is going to differ from a 45 degree angle in the cervical spine to 60 in the thoracic and finally to a more vertical 90 degrees in the lumbar spine. Just anterior to that facet joint is where we find the neural arch, also referred to as the vertebral arch. This is made up of the pedicles and lamina. And here we see our superior articular process and our inferior articular process. These will comprise our superior and inferior facet joints, which articulates with the vertebra above and below, and also provides an angulation. Our primary ligaments are our anterior longitudinal ligament and the posterior longitudinal ligament. Certainly there are others, we'll see that momentarily, but these two are the predominant ones that we see on the lumbar body. The ALL, uh, moves really from the occiput all the way to the sacrum. It's a very strong band and it blends with the disc. Those deeper fibers blend with the disc and really serves to reinforce the disc, to limit extension and provide support to the vertebral column. For the posterior longitudinal ligament, this lies along the posterior surface of the body. It's broad in the cervical region, though as we move more inferior, we find that it becomes more narrow in the lumbar. And this is one of the reasons why clinicians believe that there may be this increase in pathology incidence in the lumbar spine. Certainly it helps to limit flexion, but it also reinforces the disc. However, again, we see that occur less so in the lumbar spine. Now this illustrates not only the anterior longitudinal ligament, but also the posterior longitudinal ligament and other vertebral ligaments, such as the intertransverse, the interspinous, the supraspinous, as well as the ligamentum flavum. 
Now lying in between each vertebral body is a disc. In this case, we're looking at the L2-3 disc. And the disc is the most important connection between the vertebral bodies. They are numbered by the vertebra they connect. And so in this case, um, the, it looks like the arrow has been moved. Uh, the black numbers here indicate that the first one is actually uh, lumbar level one. Um, looks like the arrow has moved a little bit too far superior. But uh, in this case, we would say that this is the L1-2 disc, whereas the label on the screen is the L2-3 disc, which would be one down. But again, they're named for the vertebra they connect. And their function is to bind the vertebra together. They do this along with the ligaments and the individual discs have a couple different functions. They're meant to absorb shock, which is an important function that allows the transmission of force from one vertebra to the next. They also allow for movement. Oftentimes, it is considered more of a ball upon which the vertebra above is rotating. Um, they provide space, and so there is a passage for nerve roots through the intervertebral foramen that is opened up or accentuated by the presence of the intervertebral disc. And then finally, they contribute to the spinal curves. They're slightly thicker anterior in both the cervical and the lumbar spine, which is why we see an increase in lumbar lordosis, whereas in the thoracic spine and um, uh, sacral spine, we see more of a kyphotic curvature. Those intervertebral discs uh, oftentimes will correspond to the shape of the body. So therefore, if they're in the cervical spine versus the lumbar spine, they're going to look different. And their size is also going to be different. So it's dependent upon the region that they are in. In the cervical spine, it's about a two to five ratio, thoracic one to five, and in the lumbar one to three. And if we were to take all of the discs from throughout the spinal column, we would find that they make up about 20 to 25% of the length of the vertebral column. This is actually an important function then in maintaining height. And so what we see in the general population is as we're younger, our discs are a little bit more healthy. And so our height is a little bit taller. As we age, oftentimes we have something known as degenerative disc disease. Now that is a, is a term that is packed with meaning and packed with a whole bunch of information. It's beyond the limits of this uh, uh, presentation and podcast to really unpack that in its entirety. But essentially what's happening as the discs begin to change, and really those are wrinkles on the inside because they're associated with the aging process, it also desiccates. And as it desiccates, it loses some of its height. It loses some of its water supply, some of its nourishment. And so oftentimes as individuals age, you will see this slight loss in height where it appears as if they are beginning to shorten. One of the reasons why that is occurring is due to these changes at the disc level. They are primarily avascular. Only the periphery receives any blood supply, and it's very small, as you see illustrated in this image here. Injuries, therefore, um, they don't really heal that well, right? Um, the good news is, however, uh, studies from 2015 and 2017, as well as others, have demonstrated that spontaneous resorption or healing of a disc is possible. And far too often, uh, we as a medical community are going towards surgical interventions rather than exploring and utilizing conservative care measures to see if that is sufficient in providing not only relief from pain and symptoms, but also allowing the disc to then heal. There also is little nerve supply. Only the outer third of the annular wall is innervated. There are pain sensitive structures though that surround the discs, um, not only the ligaments, but most notably the nerve root. And so oftentimes when there is disc pathology, whether that's protrusion, prolapse, uh, herniation or sequestration, it's oftentimes the nerve root that is being impinged upon and irritated rather than the actual disc itself conveying that sense of danger or harm. Spinal nerves, while we're talking about them, there are 31 pairs in total. Uh, the name is according to the relationship with the vertebra. So it gets a little bit funky because in the upper cervical spine, we see that there are eight spinal nerves and yet there are only seven levels. And so in the upper cervical spine, the spinal nerve is named for the uh, level just below it. But as we move into the lumbar spine, the spinal nerve is named for the level just above above it. And as such, a disc bulge affects the nerve roots below the level of the bulge. And so if we go to our next slide here, you can see that we have 
our L45 disk. Again, remember the disk is named for the levels that are connected by it. But the L4 nerve root would be more or less protected from this disc bulge. So a more posterior lateral protrusion, which is the normal type of protrusion we see, is going to impact not the L4-5, um, uh, both spinal nerves, but only the L5 spinal nerve. L4 will be protected. Additionally, we see a few facet joints. Um, but we earlier alluded to this more superior and inferior uh, juncture. There really are three joint complexes though in the vertebral column. Uh, we have paired facet joints, so both right and left superior, right and left inferior facets, as well as a joint between the disc and the body. While the facet joints are referred to as plain type synovial joints, and there is a joint capsule there, the joint between the body is really what we would refer to as an interbody joint. It's cartilaginous made up of the intervertebral disc. And so the movement here is really a gliding movement. The direction depends upon the orientation of the facet, which in the lumbar spine is 90 degrees. And this going to vary throughout the spine. And we'll see that as we get more into the lumbar spine here momentarily. So as we begin to pivot away from more of this functional overview of the spine and towards the lumbar spine, let's start by identifying our typical lumbar vertebra. It typically is cylindrical. It gives strength and it's pretty thick because it's supporting a good amount of body weight, right? The size increases as the column descends, and that's most notable from T4 interior, inferior, excuse me. And so as we get into the lumbar spine, this is where the bodies are very sizable, specifically compared with the cervical spine. And we see a lot of trabecular bone, whereas on that more outside uh, layer, we see more compact bone. The inside is going to be more of this red marrow. It's one of the most actively hematopoietic uh, tissues within the adult. And oftentimes, uh, this is an area of interest uh, for individuals. Uh, we oftentimes can hear the term lumbar tap. Uh, this is an area where not only we might see uh, a draw of cerebral spinal fluid, but we might also see a bone marrow draw in this area as well. And then the superior and inferior surfaces that we talked about earlier, um, these are covered by hyaline cartilage. For the body, it's more kidney shaped. Those articular processes we've noted uh, are paired with both superior and inferior. The pedicles in the lamina are going to be posterior to the vertebral body. They're short. The pedicles are the only connection between the posterior joints of the segment and the vertebral bodies. And then they're going to come forward and meet up with the lamina posterior. And the lamina is an interesting thing because it unites midline, and this is where we see our spinous process. But the lamina is also an area where we can provide force if we're providing any type of a manual intervention. Also, the lamina comes into play. If you've known anyone, this is more clinical application, who's had what's known as a laminoplasty. Um, this is a decompression uh, intervention surgically performed to provide relief to the central canal if someone is dealing with stenotic features or other uh, age-related changes. The intervertebral discs um, are made up of outer rings of the annulus. Uh, these are annular fibers that are very, very dense. Uh, they exist in concentric rings, but they run obliquely and crisscross. And what this does is it adds strength to the disc. So these fibers are perpendicular. They are attached to the periphery of the vertebral body. And then at the inner portion, we find the nucleus propulsus. And it is a semi-gelatinous mass, very high water percentage. And again, this is one of the reasons why as we get older, we see that decrease in height because we start to desiccate. We start to lose some of that percentage of water. And as such, we lose some of our height. Remember, the disc contributes 20 to 25 percent to the total height of the vertebral column. Additionally, uh, as we noted, that disc helps to maintain some of the uh, openness or patency of the foramen, specifically the intervertebral foramen. This is the lateral aspect of the spinal canal where the nerve root is going to exit. We have the superior and inferior vertebral notch that is made up of the vertebra uh, both above and below.
Now that vertebral arch, also referred to as a neural arch, uh, is made up of two pedicles and the lamina. You can see that illustrated here. Uh, interestingly enough, the image on the left is an illustration of what a laminoplasty would actually look like. They've cut through the pedicle as well as the lamina and kind of removed part of that so you can see some of the structures we've already talked about. Things like the posterior longitudinal ligament, the ligamentum flavum, um, the spinal nerve, in this case, L3. You can also appreciate how if uh, in this case, this would be the disc adjoining the L3, L4 vertebral body. If that disc were to uh, either protrude, prolapse, herniate, L3 would be preserved, right? You can see that exits above the disc. So that's kind of an interesting uh, schematic here as well. But ultimately, you can appreciate how the vertebral arch is formed and how the vertebral foramen is contributed to by the arch and the posterior walls of the vertebral body. Now, we've been talking about the facet joints. These are also referred to as zygoapophyseal joints. They're one and the same. Those terms are synonymous. The articulation is made up of two consecutive lumbar vertebra. We have the lumbar vertebral bodies and the intervertebral disc, as well as the bilateral facet joints. And so in this uh, schematic, you can see that the facet joint then is made up of uh, paired inferior facets of the vertebra above with the paired superior facets of the vertebra below. Now, the function of this is to protect from anterior shear. You can imagine one vertebra on top of the next. If there was a quick anterior shear movement, that could potentially compromise the spinal cord, but the inferior facet joints are going to make contact with the superior facet joints and it's going to be limited, right? Same thing occurs with rotation and flexion. And so there is, uh, again, this bony hard limitation to exaggerated motion in these directions. Uh, as such, there is a coupling movement that's also created by this. We don't see as much of a restriction with extension or side bending from the facet joints alone. Now, there are other things that restrict that. For example, in extension, the anterior longitudinal ligament is going to restrict that. We're not going to have as much motion there, right? Side bending, similar. In fact, uh, in this case, it's not so much the anterior longitudinal ligament as it is the inner transverse ligament and other soft tissue, like in the lumbar spine, this would be the psoas major, which is coming in attaching um, uh, in this area, right? Uh, it helps with lateral flexion. And so uh, when we go to, for example, the right side, we're putting the left on stretch, right? So there are these other both intrinsic and extrinsic factors that are limiting or restricting motion beyond just the facet joint. As a reminder, we've talked about a little bit of these ligaments, but this is a nice schematic showing what they look like in the lumbar spine. We can really cleanly see here the interspinous and supraspinous ligament. We can see the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligament. We can also see uh, part of the ligamentum flavum, uh, and that is, that is observable here as we cut away uh, within that central canal. The one that is not illustrated here would be that intertransverse ligament. Now, I noted just a moment ago, there are some muscles that we want to be aware of. Uh, certainly, there are muscles intrinsic to the lumbar spine. There also are muscles that are acting a little bit at a distance. Uh, we might associate them more with the hip, uh, lumbosacral, thoracic, things along those lines. So we'll kind of work through these. The ones that get the most attention would be the quadratus lumborum, or QL, and the erector spinae, as well as the multifidae. You can see that illustrated here in this cross-sectional um, graphic from Don Newman's text, as well as if we move around to the lateral side, we can see our obliques, both internus and externus, as well as that deep transverse abdominus layer that gets a lot of attention in the lumbar spine. And then finally, the rectus abdominis, more in that anterior uh, portion. Now, there are some accessory muscles. Um, they're not illustrated on this schematic. They're, they're smaller. Um, things like the rotatories or the intertransverse sari. Uh, these function to contribute to proprioceptive and position sense. And while they're not the big muscle movers, uh, they are allowing us to fine tune our motion. And so certainly are important to the function of the lumbar spine. If we 
kind of take each one of these individually. Uh, we'll look at the QL first. The QL really extends from our 12th rib as well as the lumbar transverse processes down to uh, the top portion of our iliac crest. It's more square shaped and it serves to laterally flex the trunk. And if it functions bilaterally, it will extend the trunk, right? So if both sides are contracting, we get lumbar extension. Our innervation here is the subcostal and lumbar intercostal nerves. This is a really important muscle from a stabilization uh, standpoint. Next, we see the erector spinae. Now these are going to uh, not only be found in the lumbar spine, but also in each level, thoracic, cervical, right? Uh, they play an important role in lumbar stabilization. They help with extension of the trunk. They help with anterior shear support, as well as spine stability. And so oftentimes they are important for maintaining what we might refer to as spinal neutral or that slight lordotic curvature that we see in the lumbar spine. The nerve innervation here is the medial branch of the posterior ramus of the thoracic and lumbar spinal nerves. Now the motifidae or multifidus um, gets a lot of attention in the lumbar spine. And one of the reasons why that occurs is because it crosses the lumbosacral junction. Um, it also is going to function to rotate the vertebral column in a contralateral fashion, but also extend the vertebral column bilateral. So it kind of has an opposite function of the QL, but it really provides a lot of stability to lumbar spine. And Freeman and colleagues in 2010 illustrated that atrophy was present in approximately 80% of those with chronic low back pain. And so this really started a conversation of, is this corollary or is this causative? Are we seeing a decrease or atrophy present in multifidus because of the low back pain or because that uh, atrophy is present, is that contributing to low back pain? And certainly multifidus has a role here in the long-term health and wellness of the spine and should be a target of any comprehensive plan of care. Other abdominal muscles that we want to be mindful of, these are more um, to, the, to the lateral portion and anterior portion would be our obliques, both internal and external, as well as the transverse abdominus and the rectus abdominis. The rectus abdominis produces a torque during flexion of the vertebral column and helps to stabilize in that sagittal plane. Whereas the transverse abdominis, uh, when it contracts, it produces a rigid, almost like cylinder uh, that results in enhanced stiffness of the lumbar spine. And this has gotten a lot of press uh, within rehabilitation and strength and conditioning uh, within the last uh, really two decades. Um, it is an important muscle, certainly. We may have overemphasized its importance as a medical and, and performance community. Uh, certainly, it's important to train. However, um, it is less uh, likely to be utilized in isolation from a functional standpoint. And so that, that opens the door to further conversation over how we best train it, how we best uh, help individuals who are dealing with low back pain or are looking to return to function uh, as it relates to this individual muscle. One other one that we may not think of as an abdominal muscle uh, would be psoas major, extending from T12 to L5. It helps with lumbar flexion as well as lateral flexion in a unilateral fashion. And so we wanna include it in our conversation. Finally, we look at the lumbar fascia. There are anterior, middle, and posterior layers, and it serves as a site of muscle attachment for the transverse abdominis. It additionally stabilizes the spine from anterior shear. We've seen that a couple times, uh, like the facet joints, like the longitudinal ligaments, and it's going to resist segmental flexion. And so in doing so, it helps to transmit forces elsewhere to distribute those, attenuate those. And so the lumbar fascia is a really important structure in terms of providing more static stabilization to the lower spine. <laughs>
So as we wrap up here, um, not only do we have our, our trunk muscles that we've already talked about, but recognize there are also a few other stabilizers. And this is further discussed in a podcast looking at the hip, but particularly beyond psoas major, we also have the hamstrings and gluteus maximus. You might ask yourself, well, why are these included? Well, they control position of the pelvis. And certainly there are other uh, pelvic stabilizers, uh, muscles in and around the pelvic floor that enter the conversation. However, um, these are going to, because of their attachment to the pelvis, have a role in the position of the lower spine as well due to anterior and posterior pelvic tilt. So we want to include them in the conversation, recognize that when we're dealing with somebody who is complaining of lumbar spine uh, dysfunction or pain, and we're trying to focus on a muscle performance uh, plan of care, we need to be thinking more holistically and more regionally, not so specifically to only the lumbar spine. If we look at the function and uh, movements, uh, the first would be flexion and extension. Those are obviously our major movements that occur in the sagittal plane. Uh, part of why those are so major is because the facets really are orientated in this more vertical 90 degree fashion. And so lateral flexion and rotation is less here. This uh, really occurs in the thoracolumbar spine for both lateral flexion and rotation as we move into the lower lumbar spine, specifically L3, 4, 4, 5, and 5S1. It's particularly uh, set up for sagittal plane flexion and extension. Our capsular pattern is that, therefore, both lateral flexion and rotation are equally limited, and then extension. Um, and really, it's the, the uh, presence of the spinous processes that limits extension more than anything. We think through the biomechanics. Again, it's well designed for flexion. We don't want too much though, right? And so that's one of the reasons why we've seen a lot of these structures helping to prevent excessive shear or excessive flexion. Um, but this motion is the most commonly used motion in daily activities. If you think through uh, the various tasks that uh, require lumbar flexion, there's just a whole host of them that you're going to engage in throughout your day. Now, this occurs with unfolding or straightening of lumbar lordosis. Um, there's, there's movement out of that, as well as segmental movement um, from the upper lumbar spine getting down to L5S1, that transition period from lumbar into the sacral spine. What happens with this then is we get this anterior roll and glide of the vertebral body. Um, as such, the inferior facets move upward and backward, right? And um, through that, uh, we see this coupling pattern, right? So um, we also see side bending and rotation, uh, L1, 2, 2, 3, and 3, 4. They also share this coupling pattern um, where side bend and rotation are going to occur in opposite directions. Uh, whereas as we get into the lower lumbar spine, the coupling pattern is the same direction. That's less important um, because our interventions, uh, should someone be lacking side bending and rotation are really nonspecific. And these are already very restricted motions by the time we get to the lower lumbar spine, but it's good to appreciate what's going on uh, with the orientation of these joints. Since the spine, specifically lumbar spine, is particularly oriented towards a more sagittal motion, let's look and kind of zoom in a little bit more here with flexion and extension, what's going on. I mentioned a couple different things, right? Um, so with flexion, right, we get anterior tilt forward gliding. <clears throat> what this does is it's going to open up the intervertebral foramina. It adds a component of compression to the anterior aspect of the disc, which is going to move the nucleus pulposus more posterior. And with this, a tensile force then is placed on the annular fibers, the ligament and flavum, the capsule, and the posterior longitudinal ligament. Now, what this does, though, is it opens up that intervertebral space. This serves as the rationale for what's known as Williams flexion exercises. Williams flexion exercises have been predominantly prescribed for individuals who are dealing with spinal stenosis, because we're opening, widening that intervertebral space, we are decreasing some of the compressive forces um, at the facet joints. This is postulated to help alleviate uh, symptoms associated with stenotic changes. Extension is going to be the opposite, though. Whereas we saw an anterior tilt, 
anterior glide. Now with extension, we're gonna see a posterior tilt, posterior glide, and the intervertebral space is going to narrow by approximately 20%. Interestingly enough, the central canal is also going to narrow. And so if somebody has spinal stenosis, whether intervertebral or centrally, uh, extension is going to be a particularly provocative motion, right? However, what does extension do? Well, it provides pressure on the more posterior aspect of the disc. And so the nucleus propulsus moves anteriorly, right? This is a, a large uh, reason why we see directional preference associated with McKenzie uh, dysfunction treatment or McKenzie-based treatment, and we'll talk about that momentarily. Now, what else is happening here? Well, we noted that uh, several structures, and we've kind of talked about each one of these as we've gone, helps to resist these motions, and that's an important factor. Uh, we want some resistance to these motions so that there is a degree of static stability. So the joint capsule is going to make up almost 50% of that, right? 39%. Other ligaments are going to help with this, the supraspinous and interspinous ligaments. The ligamentum flavum is going to help with this. Even the intervertebral disc is going to help with this as it relates to flexion. With extension, um, structures anterior to the fulcrum are going to be elongated. They're going to be... Um, uh, things like the anterior longitudinal ligament, right? So those are going to be put on stretch. Uh, the intervertebral disc is also going to resist this, the degree to which it can be compressed, uh, uh, element of joint capsule tension. And then because that psoas major lies anterior uh, to the uh, kind of fulcrum for extension, it also resist this. One additional piece that's not illustrated here is just the approximation of the spinous process. You see that in this image here. As the spinous process of the vertebra above approximates to the level below, that also will resist some uh, element of extension. Now, I noted just a moment ago that this element of extension provides some of the rationale for directional preference. We see directional preference not only with McKenzie-based classification, but also with something known as treatment-based classification, TBC, uh, which is attributed to Anthony DeLito and, and, and others, Julie Fritz uh, and colleagues. Now, in both of these areas, um, there is an element of trying to diminish symptoms and to get them from peripheralization to centralization, where they come back more central to the spine. And part of what they use to accomplish that is this element of directional preference uh, going more towards flexion or more towards extension. You can appreciate if you have stenotic features, you're going to want to go more towards a flexion bias or flexion directional preference. However, if you're dealing with a disc pathology like a bulge or herniation, you're going to bias more towards an extension posture to try to alleviate some of the disc pressure or irritation on the spinal nerve root. Now, two of the motions that we mentioned just briefly are rotation and side bending. Certainly they are uh, elements of complete range of motion at the lumbar spine. Uh, rotation, however, is going to be pretty limited. Uh, about 65% of the restraint to rotation comes from just the contralateral facet joint impacting the uh, inferior facet below, right? Uh, as well as beginning to wind up the ligaments, uh, that being supraspinous and interspinous. And so there's not a lot of motion here. And that's actually a good thing, right? Um, because the facets and the zygopophyseal joints actually protect the intervertebral disc from what we would call torsional injuries. Torsional in injuries have an element of shear to them as well. Okay. Side bending, again, uh, does occur here. It is a complex movement. We uh, looked at that idea of coupling and the changes that occur from L1 to 3 and then 4 to 5 as it starts to become more sacral in orientation. Now, one of the last topics we want to look at are some anomalies in the lumbar spine. We do see uh, anomalies where things begin to change. For example, we can have lumbarization, which is where the S1 segment is actually mobile. It acts as a sixth lumbar vertebra because it's not fused with the rest of the uh, sacral spine. You can see that illustrated in this image here, as well as sacralization. This is where the L5 actually fuses to the sacrum. Now, usually these don't cause a ton of problems other than to result in a slight reduction in mobility. That idea of 
uh, sacralization is illustrated here, you can actually see where that L5 vertebra should be, but it's actually fused. Now, interestingly enough, sometimes this happens just with age. The process would be referred to as ankylosing or a, uh, a fusion that occurs with degenerative changes and age-related uh, changes. Finally, as we talk about the disc, uh, the last pieces we want to note here are that uh, with uh, disc pressure, uh, we see intrinsic pressure within the disc at around 0 0.7 kilograms per centimeter squared. We can change that disc pressure, though, based on these patterns of loading, particularly flexion and extension. If we add weight, if we're lifting, if we are in a body position, we can change where that pressure is being exerted. And in doing so, we can increase intradiscal pressure. Now, that's important if we're dealing with disc pathology. If someone has an acute exacerbation of a disc pathology, perhaps we want to back off for a little bit and allow that disc time to heal, to recover. So we might want to adopt some things that are going to unload it. Notchamson and colleagues have provided uh, a bit of a, of a graphic back in 1981 to suggest that these different postures uh, either increase intradiscal uh, pressures or alleviate them. Um, however, our understanding of the spine has evolved considerably since 1981. That was 40 years ago. And so um, for us to think that that load is a particularly volatile movement for the spine is really flawed, right? Certainly disc pressure is something we want to be aware of, but to link disc pressure to pain and then to extrapolate that further and say, all disc pressure is bad. Well, then if that's the case, we really should heed Peter O'Sullivan's guidance here and just tell people to lie down. Load is okay. In fact, load can be healthy. It's an adaptive process. Think of things like Wolf's Law, right? Or the SED principle, specific adaptation to impose demand. Load is healthy. Rather, as Tim Gabbett and others have cautioned us uh, towards, it's the load that we're not prepared for that is more detrimental to our health. Finally, Recognize that load is highly variable. This was a fascinating study that was performed in 2014 that took everyday individuals and exposed them to everyday life events. Now, remember we said flexion is highly variable and you do it a whole lot. Well, guess what? This is an illustration of that. And they took these five individuals and they had them do all these activities of daily lifting, like lifting weights and walking and tying shoes and washing their face. And the load was widely variable. The takeaway here is there's lots of variation in how our individual bodies load themselves during activities. This is complex stuff. So for us to kind of paint with a broad brushstroke and say load is bad or interdiscal pressure is bad uh, and, and just kind of leave it at that with a blanket statement is a bit uh, short-sighted when we appreciate just how uh, remarkable our individual ecosystems are. With that, we're going to conclude this podcast on the anatomy, kinesiology, and biomechanics of the lumbar spine. Hopefully, uh, this has provided you with an, uh, an appreciation for the wide degree of variance within this area of the body. Uh, certainly, if there are questions, comments, or concerns, reach out at your convenience.